All right, so here's the situation. Uh, it's May 31st. There's a homework that is due tonight. It's the last one that's online um, via WebAssign. Also, I've handed around a piece of paper, which is a bit shorter than the final exam will be, but somewhat similar in scope. Um, so this is the last homework assignment. You'll um, come up with the answers to the 27 true-false questions there. And there's a link that's a uh, very short URL at the top, which you can go to, and then you can put in your answers, along with your name, and then submit it. And I'll just um, automatically grade the homework based on that by writing a little program. OK, um, so that's the, that'll be the last homework assignment. And that one's due next Wednesday. Um, it says in class, but actually, since it's electronic, you could turn it at the end of the day on Wednesday at 11.59. So as it says on the exam. OK, questions. Uh, who's first? You're first. Um, is it graded on participation? What? Participation? <laughs> you just said participation. Oh. oh, no, it just has to be right. But I mean, it's true, false. It would be impossible to grade it on. You have two. You have two two attempts. <laughs> okay, yeah, but those are. I mean, um, yeah. You dropped the two lowest homework scores. Though, right? That's correct. Yeah, so I dropped the two lowest homework scores. Um, but yeah, you only have one chance on the true false here to get the right. And there's no feedback immediately um, because I'll just make the solutions available at, right after the homework's due. And this, the form is timestamped, so you can't just wait for the solutions and turn it in. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yep, I'll make them available. Uh, OK, other questions about anything? OK, and as you know, the final's on the 12th at some point in time and at some location, which everyone should be able to figure out. OK, what we're going to do today is continue talking about change of bases matrices topic that we started at the very end last time. And that will be our main topic for today. And the only other uh, real, I mean, the main topic next week will be orthogonal vectors. And um, that's actually what the other instructor is doing in the class right now. If you back here, you see stuff involving the word orthogonality and orthonormal and so on. So that's what we'll be talking about during the next OK, so what we're talking about today is a special case of matrices of a linear transformation. Um, oh, I guess uh, before I forget, if you go to the course website, then the place you can get an electronic version of this um, last homework assignment is if you click on homework and then mock final then that's where you'll find it. OK? That's, there's a PDF file there. So. OK, so our main topic is um, matrix of a linear transformation, and then in particular, a uh, special case of it, which we introduced at the very end last time, which is um, the case when the two vector spaces are the same, and the linear transformation is the identity matrix, the identity transformation. But the two bases could be different. So uh, I'll copy that definition be in kind of a box at the top, because it's what we're going to use repeatedly for everything. And here it is. Um, the situation is that you have a linear transformation T from one vector space D to potentially another vector space W. So W could equal V. This is a linear transformation. And you have bases B and C. These are bases for B and W. And what a basis is, is it's a collection of vectors that are in order. Bases have an order to them. There's a first basis vector, a second basis vector, and so on. The collection of vectors in order whose span is your space. And no um, smaller collection of vectors will give you that span. In other words, um, the dimension of the space is equal to the number of elements of a basis. So 
we have these two bases that is linearly independent vectors that span each of the corresponding spaces. And then we define the matrix of this linear transformation with respect to these two choices of bases to be the matrix whose i column is, what you do is you just kind of do the only natural thing imaginable. You take the i element of the basis B, you apply T to it, because that's all you can do with it. The result is an element of W, and then you consider its coordinates, you need a vector after all, with respect to the basis C. And that's it. That's the definition. It's really the only definition, only interesting natural definition you can make with this as the input. Uh, quick comment. I was looking in the book and they have a more, they have a more elaborate notation for the same thing. So, um, in the book, for some reason, they call this thing T, C, arrow, B. With the arrow going backwards. So watch out for that. And I it's too lazy to typeset an arrow going backwards, so I wrote it that way. But mistake. Um, so this is the same thing in the book. It's changing from B to C. But they put an arrow in and they put it in the other order. I don't know. I mean, I can make up a lot of notations. But whenever I write it, when I, I'll just write B comma C, and I mean from B to C, which I think is pretty clear. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. I'll never use that notation ever again. Okay, so here's an example. I very briefly, for like one second, put this up on the slide last time, but let's go through it in detail. So this is a special case the change of basis matrix. So here, the slightly bigger, yeah. Okay, so here the idea is you take V and W to be the same, and you take T to be the identity map, which is a natural <coughs> example of a linear transformation from a vector space to itself. So, uh, but then you have two different bases. B and C, potentially different bases, and you ask for the linear transformation with respect to those two different choices of bases. And what you get is what's called the change of basis matrix, uh, the matrix of the linear transformation that's the identity map with respect to those two choices of bases. It's some matrix, and it has the property that if you take a vector in your space and write it in terms of B, then apply that matrix, that is multiply it on the left by that matrix, you get back your vector again, but written in terms of C. Okay? So that is a, a linear transformation uh, given by a matrix. So let's uh, do this. So it's just that special case. Change of basis matrix equals that special case. Change of basis, special case V equals W. T equals the identity. But B and C can be anything. And um, let's figure out how to do it. Here's an example. You can just think of this as yet another example of the idea of the matrix of a linear transformation. But we'll see as soon as we start doing this, it starts getting, I don't know, a little bit difficult and annoying. And we'll be able to write down a little identity down here, which will make it more systematic and straightforward to compute this without having to go kind of from the beginning. Okay, so that's part of the point of this. And it's an extremely useful special case because um, often the way you get one of these general matrices is in several different steps, and some of the steps will involve a change of basis matrix like this. So this is a really useful special case to have at your fingertips. Okay, so let's just work out a simple example, which is the one on the board. V is R2, and well, um, our identity, the transformation is the identity matrix, so we just choose two bases. We'll make B, I'm going to give a basis for R2. So these are the two vectors in order, which I might call B1 and B2, 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. And then C, the other basis, consists of 1, 2, and 3, 1. 
so C1 and C2. Okay. Now what I'll do is simply compute the matrix of the linear transformation, the identity map, from RG to R2, but the wrinkle is it's with respect to these two choices of bases. Okay? That's what makes it interesting. If you wanted to compute the, ma the matrix of the identity map with respect to the standard basis, that's easy. It's just the identity matrix. Okay, so let's compute. Let's figure out what T, where T is the identity. I'm sorry, identity here. The identity map, not the identity matrix, um, BC. Okay? So from the definition, you simply take each B, you apply the linear transformation, and then you write it with respect to C. Okay? So let's do it. So this matrix is, the matrix, um, whose columns are as given. B1 is 1, 1, that vector. What happens when you apply T to it? Well, you just get back the vector 1, 1 in R2, because T is the identity function. But now we have to write, in order to get the column of this matrix, we need to do something with C. So we have to write 1, 1 in terms of those two vectors. Okay, which is something you know how to do. It's solving a system of linear equations, after all. You're just solving 1, 2, 3, 1, and then you have some x here equals 1, 1. That's how you find the coefficients, um, or T of bi with respect to the basis C. That's how you write it in terms of C. So we have to figure out what linear combination of these two vectors gives us 1, 1, and that'll be the first column of the matrix. Um, you know, that's something you know how to do by various methods. But we're going to do it twice. So we'll do that for the first column. We're going to do exactly the same problem again, but for the second column. So we're also going to solve this, but for second column, which is 1 minus 1. And so you can solve this by computing the um, inverse of 1, 3, 2, 1. And since you're doing two of them, you could just think of it as solving, well, I mean, you could compute the inverse of this matrix and then apply it to 1, 1 and to 1 minus 1. And that will give you these linear combinations. Or you can just kind of try to eyeball it. That's a bad idea because in general it might be pretty hard to do. Or you can put this matrix in reduced row echelon form, keeping track of the 1, 1, and you know, get the solution. So you know many ways to do this. Um, but it would be nice to really understand, in terms of a matrix operation, how to just write down this change of basis matrix. Because it is kind of annoying that there's like several different systems here. If you, we're doing this with uh, three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space, then you'd end up with four different systems. It's kind of tedious. So, let's look. So notice that in each case you're solving this times that equals this. So solving for the change of basis matrix, the same as finding the matrix so that 1, 3, 2, 1 times the change of basis matrix is equal to 1, 1, 1, minus 1. That's kind of hard. Let me move that over. So notice um, 1, 3, 2, 1 times the change of basis matrix is equal to 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Okay, so in fact, all you have to do is invert this guy right here. Multiply it by that, and you'll get the change of basis matrix. And this is true in general. Um, anytime you're trying to find the change of basis matrix from one basis to another, um, if you've, so let's, at least in the case of Rn, what you can do is write down two matrices and then invert one of them, multiply it by the other, and you get the change of basis matrix. So. Is that why the order of bases matter? Yeah. The, nothing we would be doing would be well defined if the order of the bases didn't matter. You'd have uh, kind of two n factorial different possibilities, and nothing would make any sense. You'd get very confused. OK, so, it's, so I mean, the answer's right there, but you really, uh, to get that, you could, um, I mean, 
just, a, just some arithmetic at this point. So uh, I guess I want to make a remark about how this works in general. So in general, this is the product of C inverse and square bracket B. Here I mean, so B and C are bases. By square bracket C, I mean make the matrix that has columns the elements of the basis C. And by square brackets B, I mean make the, I mean the same thing. Make the matrix that has columns the elements of B, and it's just the inverse of one times the other. And now, um, I want to convince you, irregardless of all this calculational stuff that I'm suggesting, that this makes sense. Okay, so conceptually, the change of basis matrix is supposed to be something that takes any vector written in terms of the basis is B and gives it back to you written in terms of the basis C. Okay? That's what it's supposed to do. If you write a vector in terms of the basis B and then multiply it by this matrix, then what you're doing, given that your so if, if your vector is uh, so it's C1 or C is not true, so maybe it's your vectors X1 B1 plus X2, B2. So if you consider that vector and write it in terms of the basis B, what vector is it? What are the entries of the vector? What are the entries of the coordinate vector? X1 and X2. They're just the coefficients right here. So if you take X1 and X2, if you take that coefficient vector, which is exactly the same thing as B, this thing's little v, then v written with respect to b, it's x1, x2. If you multiply this by the matrix whose columns are b, b sub i, you get back v. And then if you multiply that by c inverse, you're exactly figuring out, you're solving these systems. So you're exactly figuring out what combination of the columns of c gives you that vector, gives you v. And that's in fact your vector v written with respect to the columns of c. Okay, so yes? So for this to work, um, mm -hmm. this c would have to be invertible, but this b would have to be invertible? Um, this formula, no, that's a, a good point. So the formula makes no sense if c were not invertible. Fortunately, these are bases for um, Rn here. And hence, when you make a matrix out of if you take a basis and make the entries in the basis the columns of the matrix, then that matrix will automatically be invertible. Because um, there's a lot of ways to characterize invertible, but for example, a matrix is invertible if the system AX equal to zero has a unique solution. And if the columns of a matrix A are a basis for your vector space, then AX equal to zero has to have a unique solution because there's a unique way to write uh, zero as a linear combination of the columns. So uh, maybe I'll just write down what I'm claiming. The matrices square brackets B and square brackets C are invertible because their uh, columns are a basis. There are many different ways to see that. So, in other ways, you could just transpose the matrices, and then the rows of the matrices are a basis for your space. And basis, by definition, implies that they're linearly independent, which means you can't find any um, linear relations between the rows. And hence, when you put it in reduced rational form, you won't have any zero rows. So it has to be invertible. Um, Okay, ask another question about this. Yes? So if you want to go from C to B, you can just do B inverse and C? Uh, that's a very good question. How do you get from, do, how do you do the opposite? How do you get from writing things in terms of C to writing things in terms of B? Yeah. C times the inverse of B with the, times the coordinate vector respect to C instead of B this time. So B, C instead of B, B. 
Yeah, I mean, just swap the row of B and C. And you also so swap B B, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. B, C. Yeah, and I, I mean, so the equation kind of stops there and it's multiplying both sides. But if you wanted to find the transformation that goes from the basis C to the basis B, it would be B inverse C. Just exactly swap the row. It's completely symmetric. Um, and notice that that should be the inverse of this. It's the in, it would be the inverse matrix. Um, let me write that up here. Good double check. So the change of basis matrix from B to C is C inverse B. And the change of basis matrix from C to B, since it's symmetric, is B inverse C. And check. Are those two matrices inverses of each other? Like a sanity check on what we're doing. Just do the algebra. I mean, think about it. If you multiply these together, these two matrices cancel, and then the other two cancel. Right? So um, their product is the identity, which is a good sign. And if you multiply them the other way, of course, you also get the identity. And that's. That's good because if conceptually think about it. If you're taking a vector written in terms of, say, the basis B, and then you do some matrix multiplication that's supposed to give it to you in terms of C, and then you do another matrix multiplication that's supposed to give it to you back in terms of B, you better get back what you started with. So the composition is the identity. Okay? So that's an important observation. The change of basis matrix from B to C is the inverse of the change of basis matrix from C to B. So in general, if you ever want to compute a change of basis matrix, it's just if it's going from B to C, the formula for it is the matrix of the basis C inverse times the matrix corresponding to the basis B. That's it. And the reason that this can be incredibly confusing and tricky is merely because it's really easy to get confused and think it should be the other way around or think the inverse should be on the other side. I mean, there's just like... There's basically three, there's four possibilities here. Because you can have the inverse on either side, and you can have the order in either way. And it's possible to get, just get confused. I mean, it's a really simple formula for the change of basis matrix. But there's four possibilities for it. And when you're working with a lot of different stuff, um, it's easy to maybe switch one of them around or get the inverse confused, and then you're in deep trouble um, if you're composing many of these together to solve some more complicated problem. But I'll record this now in a little box. Um, so the change of basis, this is the case of Rn, or C of, an, of a space like Rn. It doesn't make any sense to write square brackets B or square brackets C if the elements of the basis aren't actually themselves vectors, right? Just wouldn't make any sense. I'm only able to have matrices corresponding to these bases because everything is inside of Rn. So change of basis in Rn um, is just C inverse B. But I think the way to kind of, I mean, it's really good to just convince yourself that this has to be the right thing whenever you use it. And all you have to do is just think, oh, I wrote something in terms of B, and now if I multiply it right here, I get the I get literally that something back, and then multiplying by C inverse is writing in terms of the columns of C, and so that's the right thing. Okay? It's just easy to check that this is true after the fact. Okay, next example which will just be an application or revisiting of what I just told you, is the idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So remember, we did a bunch of them. You can reinterpret them in terms of um, matrices with respect to different choices of basis, or computing the matrix of a linear transformation with respect to some choice of basis. So in general, you, you, um, you have this problem that you might wonder about. 
suppose you have a linear transformation t from a vector space to itself. Um, is there some basis for the vector space so that, so is there a basis p b for v such that the matrix of T with respect to the basis B is diagonal. This is a question that you can ask for a particular linear transformation T. Sometimes, I mean, um, there are some T for which the answer is no, and there are some T for which the answer is yes. Just like with matrices, sometimes some matrices are diagonalizable and some aren't. And I hope that you appreciate that this could be a useful question to be able to answer. Um, so you could have, for example, some funny linear transformation from a space of a vector space of polynomials to itself, or from a vector space of some sort of functions to itself. And then you might ask, is there some vec is there some basis somewhere? I mean, of all the possible bases for V, is there one so that in fact my linear transformation is diagonal? And if so, if, my, if the matrix of the linear transformation with respect to that basis is diagonal, then you might make certain other problems easy. For example, computing a large power of t acting on the vector space, um, or uh, understanding the geometry of t, how it stretches and spins around and deforms your space. That's much easier if t is given by a diagonal matrix. OK, so that's kind of motivation for why you might want to do this. I mean, if, if I gave you some question again, and, uh, for example, maybe here's a, here's a sort of problem you might have. Suppose you have an x over here, and you want to know whether or not there's some vector here that maps to x. If t were given by a diagonal matrix, then that would be a very easy question to answer. As you know, it's just sort of very clear how the linear transformation transforms things if it's diagonal. OK, so there's the question. And the eigenvalue and eigenvector stuff allows you to solve this question, and it even allows you to find b if, in fact, you can do it. So the solution is use eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And it might not look like you can solve it that way at first, because there's no matrices or no Rn or C to the N or anything here. But what you do is you just make some choice of basis for B. And then there is a matrix. And then you just do what you did before with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and decide whether or not that thing can be um, diagonalized. And if so, then you get from the completely arbitrary choice of basis that you make for V to some other one where you've diagonalized. So you can answer it, but to answer it, you have to, you, you just make an arbitrary choice of a basis. So let's just do one example. So there's a particular matrix A, which is 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 1. And we're viewing this as defining a linear transformation from R2 to R2, which I'll call T. OK, and the question is, is there some basis for R2 such that this linear transformation, when consider its matrix with respect to that basis, is diagonalized, is diagonal. So uh, do we ever have that t with respect to b is diagonal? Question 0, 0, question 4. Does that ever happen? And we can answer that question. It's really just the same as diagonalizing this matrix. Which, let's just, um, let's just do it really quickly, because it's a really good review of some key thing that you just know how to do. So, uh, how do you diagonalize a matrix? You just compute the characteristic polynomial, and then for each of the eigenvalues, you compute the corresponding eigenvectors. So the characteristic polynomial, x minus a, the determinant of x minus a, so the determinant of x minus 1 minus 2 minus x minus 1, the determinant, so it's x squared minus x minus positive 2, and I guess this factor is uh, something x minus 2x plus 1. Okay. 
So that means that you have two eigenvectors uh, with eigenvalues 2 and minus 1. And so you can then find each of them. So the eigenvalue with eigen the eigenvalue minus 1, there's some corresponding eigenvector. So you just find that by computing something in the null space. We put minus 1 in here. And so it looks like 1, 1 works. So we have an eigenvector of what? V sub 1 equals 1, 1. And then for the other eigenvalue, 2, again, you just put it in for x. So 2 minus 1 minus 2. Uh, one and something in the the null space of this matrix is one two so that's equal to zero so the other eigenvector is one two okay and we can now take these eigenvectors you form the basis for R two consisting of the eigenvectors and it will turn out that the matrix of this linear transformation with respect to that basis is a diagonal matrix. Okay, let's see that. Is it the first one the Did I get it wrong? Or should the eigenvector be one? Yes, it's totally wrong. Thank you. Good. Okay, so uh, so we'll take our basis to be basis of eigenvectors. So uh, E1 will be 1 minus 1, and then D2 is 1, 2. And now, with respect to this basis, I hope that T is diagonal. And let's just do it. So the matrix of T with respect to this basis. So uh, remember, we just wrote down a formula for that. Uh, actually, we didn't. That was a change of basis matrix. This is just choice of basis, a linear transformation with respect to a choice of basis, so it's slightly different. So, uh, going back to, say, the definition, if you wanted, you could do it that way, but um, there's an easier way to see how this works. So. I'll put a question mark here and then show you how you can just kind of write down what's going on easily. Um, well, I'll tell you what the answer is going to be. So the eigenvalue minus 1, that corresponds to the first basis vector, and the eigenvalue 2 corresponds to the second one. So you'll get a diagonal matrix with these entries down the diagonal. But now let me show you why that is. So. Um, So in order to compute this, I should say y, um, but in order to compute this, what we need to do is write down the matrix whose columns are just given by this definition. So if we apply a to 1 minus 1, that's actually really easy. Because 1 minus 1 is an eigenvector, and the eigenvalue is minus 1. So we know exactly what happens. It just scales it by minus 1. So that's what you get. The first one gets scaled by minus 1. And so written in terms of this basis, so I'll just write out in painful detail, um, T applied to B1 written in terms of the basis B. And then T applied to B2 written in terms of the basis B. So think about it. If you take t applied to b1, you just scale it by minus 1. And then when you write that in terms of the basis, it's minus 1, 0, because you just rescale the first one. Then when you do the same with the second, you take t and apply it. That is the multiplication by the matrix A. Apply that to b2. b2 is an eigenvector. And so you're just going to rescale b2 in some way, namely by 2. And when you write the result in terms of b1 and b2, you just get 2 times b2. So the second column is 0, 2. So that's why you get this. Uh, so basically, when using this definition in the case when v is equal to w and the two bases are the same, um, if you choose your basis to be a basis of eigenvectors, then the whole calculation is very easy 
and you end up with a diagonal matrix. So uh, again, this idea of a linear transformation being given by a matrix with respect to some choice of basis uh, is a different way of thinking about the diagonalization process that you do with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The whole business with all this stuff about eigenvalues and eigenvectors is just about, I mean, it's an, you can think of it as giving a situation where computing this is really, really easy. The simplest possible situation when you're trying to compute this part of the formula is exactly the situation that comes up if you choose a basis of eigenvectors. And so you can also relate this to um, change of basis matrices, which is what I did right here. OK, so uh, what else? So this is completely general. I just did an example for uh, two by two matrices, but it's all very general. So again, the, uh, the question that I ask can be just reduced to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let's do it, though. Um, we'll do this one example. This will be our last example for the day. So this is diagonalizing a linear transformation, but the wrinkle is that instead of a map from R2 to R2 or R3 to R3 or something like that, it's a map from a vector space of polynomials over the complex numbers to itself. So that is potentially a little more confusing, but it's really good because it shows you how this idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and diagonalization can be transformed into a general setting. It's not something that only makes sense in the context of Rn or C to the n. Okay, so here's the example. We'll consider the vector space V of polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 over the complex numbers. They're polynomials with complex coefficients. And the linear transformation from V to V, which is given by T of C plus BX plus AX squared is equal to B plus AX plus CX squared. Notice what I've done. I, it, there's inputs a polynomial, the outputs a polynomial, and I've shifted the coefficients over by one, looping around. So that's what this shifts all the coefficients to the left by one. Maybe to the right if I wrote polynomial in the other order. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll show that, in fact, there is some basis for this space such that the matrix of T with respect to that basis is diagonal. So claim there's a basis with T with respect to that basis diagonal. And from that, you can conclude things about T and solve various problems about this particular somewhat uh, subtle linear transformation. Notice if you apply T three times that you get back where you started. Just pointing that out. T composed of T composed of T is the identity, which is a good thing to keep in mind. OK, so uh, let's just do a few things. So first, in order to apply this whole idea, of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors to your abstract setting, it's critical to choose some basis. It doesn't matter necessarily which basis you choose, but you can't even get going if you don't choose a basis. Otherwise, your vector space is really abstract. Um, it's just these polynomials or whatever other weird thing you have. The second you choose a basis, though, then you can write everything in terms of that basis, and then you can apply all the machinery that you've developed about Rn, or C to the n, or whatever. So uh, let's choose the basis 1x and x squared for v. That's a great choice of basis because it's really easy to see the coordinates of a vector in this vector space in terms of that basis. On the other hand, it's not such a great choice of basis because uh, certainly with respect to this particular linear transformation, or 
In terms of this linear transformation, this matrix won't be diagonal, and so it doesn't sort of immediately answer this question. But it's good from some points of view and bad from others. But we'll just uh, consider basis 1, x, and x squared. And let's just write down the matrix of t with respect to this basis, which I, um, I didn't call it anything, so I'll just call it E. This is kind of a standard sort of basis. Let's find the matrix of the linear transformation T with respect to E. And it's given right there on the slide. Um, so all you do to show that it's what I've given on the slide, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. It's just the same thing. You take the first basis vector 1, you apply the linear transformation, and you get x squared, and that's the third basis vector, and you write x squared in terms of the third basis vector. There it is. I mean, in terms of the basis. There it is. It's 0, 0, 1. Take the second basis vector, x, apply the linear transformation, you put in x, you get out 1. Now write 1 in terms of your basis. It's 1, 0, 0. Finally, take x squared, apply this function to it, you get x, because you're just setting a equal to 1 and b and c equal to 0. And now x written in terms of this basis is, one, is a 0, 1, 0. So there you are. And now we just step back and apply exactly what you already know to do really well to this particular matrix. You find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Okay? Now you find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And it's a little bit uh, tricky because complex numbers are involved. But you end up finding, I'll show you what you get and how you get it. There's three distinct eigenvalues. Um, what I did was I took the matrix, I took x minus the matrix and computed the determinant, and I got x cubed minus 1, which has three roots, namely 1, and then two other numbers whose cube is 1, which you can get from the quadratic formula after factoring x cubed minus 1. The two other roots are minus 1 plus root minus 3 over 2, and minus 1 minus root minus 3 over 2. And then you can write down the corresponding eigenvectors, those corresponding to those three eigenvalues. Um, one of the eigenvectors is 1, 1, 1, and the other two are 1 and then lambda 2, lambda 3, and 1, lambda 3, lambda 2. Happen to be eigenvectors. And um, now what you do is you take the basis B to be the basis consisting of those three eigenvectors written as elements of P2 again. So for example, 1, 1, 1 corresponds to 1 plus x plus x squared, given our choice of basis. So we take 1 plus x plus x squared. And then v2 is 1 plus lambda 2x plus lambda 3x squared. And v3 is 1 plus lambda 3x plus lambda 2x squared. Okay, so you have those three polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2. And when you consider the matrix of the linear transformation T with respect to this choice of basis, you get something that's diagonal. And the diagonal entries are 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. So the matrix of T with respect to B is 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. Just, it's that diagonal matrix. The thing at the bottom is something else. So. so the point is just that you can apply this definition in a whole bunch of different contexts. And um, though it seems really simple, it is the key for connecting anything abstract involving vector spaces and something you might want to compute with something concrete involving matrices and n-tuples that you can compute. Okay? So many problems get transformed, like this problem, which at its surface might seem kind of
kind of like how do you even begin to answer the question, does there exist a basis with this property? But the answer is you just simply pick coordinates so that everything is written in terms of coordinates. And then after you've done that, you can solve your problem. Does that feel at all like what you saw in calculus sometimes, where you have a problem that seems somewhat abstract, but then you pick coordinates, nail things down, and then you can solve it? No? Yeah? Pretty common technique. And if you, you, there's lots of different choices here. I chose the basis 1xx squared and then tried to diagonalize in terms of that. You could have chose a different basis. All the arithmetic would be different, but you'd arrive at the same answer in the end. Um, so this is just another example, which I'll, well, And still I'll ask it as a question. Is there, can anybody give me an example of a linear transformation from V to V that's not diagonalizable, which there doesn't exist such a basis? Maybe I'll call it S. S from V to V, not diagonalizable. Um, sure, but then, but I want to, I want it to be very concrete. I want something that takes as input a polynomial, like c plus bx plus ax squared, and it outputs a polynomial. Give me a formula for such a linear transformation that um, cannot be diagonalized, in the sense that there's no basis for polynomials of degree at most two, such that the matrix of this linear transformation is diagonal. And you're right, you just have to put it up. I want it in terms of a formula. And I sneakily made it scroll by so that you didn't see it. Any ideas? Even if you don't know the answer, any ideas how you might find such a thing? If, you, if I asked you to find a 3 by 3 matrix that's not diagonalizable, do you do that? Given that it's the only matrix on the screen here. <laughs> so that, that matrix right there is not diagonalizable. Um, it's just because if you compute the characteristic polynomial, it's x cubed. The only eigenvalue is 0, but... Um, yeah. Can you say a, like, equal to a? Uh, maybe? Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, because then the matrix would be... Uh, I think that works. Yeah, yeah that exactly gives you that matrix. Right there. Good job. <laughs> Uh, I <laughs> 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 